We had to shorten the title of this book to Apostolic Advancement, but really it's about the power of vision, the force of culture, and then the systems to put all that into place, to build the infrastructure to get us from where we are right now to where we need to be. And so if you're working in a position or a place of responsibility of leadership, this is four authors, amazing people that have done amazing things, and uh, all laid out, actually it's five authors, one of them is our cultural statements from all of our Bible College students and staff around the Victory Asia platform. But the key is that we've put invested our very best uh, knowledge, information and stories into one small package. The idea of this is it goes across Asia with all of our apostolic leaders, but we want to make it available to you as well because I absolutely know it will be a tremendous blessing for your life and uh, just great, right to the point. You know, the neat thing about it is we get to do these uh, summits every year in Thailand or wherever we are in Asia, bring all of our 10 nations together, and we get to really focus on exactly what it is that, that, that has made us who we are and that is going to take us where we need to go. And that's what's in these books. And so you want to get this apostolic advancement, uh, just contact us and we'll make sure that you get one and that you're blessed. Honestly, the last two, two messages that I have given are a setup for this one. This one's going to launch us to a whole nother level. I, I believe this is the one that I was most excited to get to. Uh, and we're going to just pray that and receive uh, from Holy Spirit that he's going to speak directly to you. Not to our intellect, but to our, our spirits. Amen. This is going to bear fruit in our lives. Lord, we thank you. and We invite you, Holy Spirit, to minister to each one of us. We open up to receive from you, and Lord, I pray that we would be able to understand with our spirits and, and with our minds, and that we'd be able to take this and, and plant it as a seed that will bear fruit in our lives and ministries in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, now faith, that's now, that's today, now faith is the confident assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And, it, and then it goes to list in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews goes to list all of these men and women of faith, and it begins to describe and give us a definition of what faith is. And that's what I want to do today. I want to unpack what faith is. Without faith, it says in verse 6, it is impossible to please God. Okay, so we need faith in order to please God, and we want to please God in order to see what we, we need to accomplish. But I, I've got to say that, that after years of listening to the faith message, there was a small little tweak that I had misunderstood that I want to, I want to this, is, this is what God is doing in me. So I'm just giving you my Bible study. There's a small little tweak that God has been doing in me that is changing everything. I, I, I can't even describe it. It's changing everything, shifting everything. And I believe it's a word for today. It's a now faith word. And we want to be able to receive this. And we're studying in particular from, from Abraham in verse 8. It says, by faith. Okay, so that's, this is how Abraham did what Abraham did. By faith. Now faith is the confident assurance. By faith. Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. That's a good key to faith, obedience, okay, by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going, okay, this is, this is, this is key, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going, and we're trying to awake that pioneer spirit in us, amen, that, that pioneer risk-taking marching off the map spirit in, in, in us and saying, I don't know, you know where I'm going. I don't know what it's going to look like. All I know is that I'm stepping out. We learned that yesterday that, that, uh, that all of the moves of God that happened in the Bible required a man, just like what Teddy was talking about, it, the breakthrough in the worship here in Thailand required a man to step out. Right? Requires someone, it always requires someone to step out and then God. Daniel stepped out, determined in his heart, then God showed up. Okay? God didn't show up and give him a revelation saying, Daniel, this is what you, you know, this is what you should do. Didn't have an audible voice from God for him to step out. Daniel stepped out and then God showed up. 
Okay, God called Abraham and said, go. Abraham had to actually go. Amen? He had to pioneer, go where no one had gone before, doing things no one has done before. That's the spirit of a pioneer. Verse 9, by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the land of promise. In a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, uh, fellow heirs of the same promise. Okay, so he, he left and he dwelt in tents. Pioneers are willing to put up with less, with the small things, because they are taking hold of something bigger. Amen. They're willing to sacrifice now in order to grab a hold of something bigger. Okay, too many people, this is a generation that I've seen, that too many people in today's generation, it, it was in the 70s, 80s, people were risk takers, taking out, stepping out, but too many people, listen to me young people, too many people in today's generation are, are valuing safe security and are less, more, less apt to take risks than the generations before. That has to change in order for us to accomplish what God wants to do. We have to be risk takers. We have to be willing to step out, to go out, to do things, to break through. Okay, and, and now listen, just because, well, I stepped out once. God doesn't ever ask us just to step out once. It's a daily faith walk. Okay, now faith. That wasn't, we're not relying on yesterday's faith. We're relying on now faith. We're not relying on tomorrow's faith. We're relying on now faith. Okay, that God wants us to step out. Now, here's the verses that I want to focus on uh, today is verse 11. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she uh, considered him faithful who had promised. Okay, now that verse is kind of funny because the writer of Hebrews credits Sarah for having this admirable faith to believe. Yet when I actually go and read the story, uh, she wasn't exactly a pillar of faith. Okay, so let's, let's go read it in, in Genesis 18. Because this is the shift of faith. Because the credit that was given her, watch this, the credit that was given her, they credit her by faith. She broke through. So she got the result. We, we know the end of the story. She got the result. But the, the, and the writer of Hebrews credits her for this kind of faith. Okay? Credits her for this kind of faith. But let's look at what God had to do in her. And this is what we're getting, this is the shift that, that God has to do in some of us. Is exactly what's going on here. How many are believing for something right now? You don't have. You're believing for something you don't have right now. You've got your eye on something, okay? And faith is the hand that receives from God. By faith is what we're going to be able to reach out and please God and grasp that. But we we there's a a, a slight shift, not slight. It's a massive one actually, that 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 God took Sarah through before she could be able to grasp this. Okay, now watch this. It says this in, in, in Genesis 18. We're there? Everyone's there? Okay, uh, let's start verse 10. God shows up and, and in, in person to talk to Abraham and Sarah. That, how many think I could, you could have faith? God showed up in person, you'd go, I believe, whatever you say. I mean, he shows up in person. This is pretty impressive, right? God shows up in your hotel room tonight says, this is, this is what I've promised you, you'd be like, yes, Lord. You'd be in shock and awe. You'd expect that they would just believe just because he showed up. But look what happened. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now, i got to point this out. This is chapter 18. This promise first showed up in Genesis 12. God then said it again in Genesis 15. And then he said it again in Genesis 17. And here we are in chapter 18. God is repeating himself over and over again. And there's a shift that has to happen in Abraham and Sarah's minds in order for God to get the breakthrough through to him. He's, he's, con he's renewing their minds, enlarging their thinking to be able to handle the miracle. When God first promised this miracle, Abraham was 75 years old, too old to have a baby. Okay, in the, in the, for, for Sarah. 
Okay? When God shows up in, in Genesis 17, Abraham is 99 years old. And, and, and he's 99 years old here in Genesis 18. He shows up again and promises the exact same thing again. Okay? He didn't believe the first time. God is saying it and repeating it and saying we've got to do it again. Okay, so now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. So verse 12, this is Sarah's amazing faith. Sarah laughed. Remember, the writer of Hebrews said that Sarah had this amazing faith, and by faith she conceived and had a child. And then you go read the story, and God said to her, and Sarah hears it, and she laughs. Look what she says. After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Verse 13, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Now watch this. This is, this is so key. Why does Sarah laugh and ask this question? This is what God says. Shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? Verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? This is the shift. You got to, got to get this. All eyes are on me for a second. I need you to get this. Sarah asked the question, is it possible for me in my old age to have a child? God promised Sarah, you'll have a child. Sarah asked the question, is it possible for me to have a child? God says, wrong question. Wrong question. The right question is, is anything too difficult for our God? So this is the face shift. We think, and I need you to get this, we think in faith that if I want to have faith to move this pulpit, that I need to have the, the faith, if I want to move a mountain, I want to move the pulpit, I need to have the faith, if I want to move a mountain, I need to have the faith the size of a mountain. And I got to stir up my faith to the size of the answer that I'm trying to do. And I got to stir up and I got to believe and I got to work it. 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 I got to work it to have faith. If I have faith to move this pulpit, I need to have the faith the size of this pulpit. I got to work it up to get the size of this pulpit. And God says, that's not faith at all. The faith that, that you need to have is not in the answer. Faith is not for the answer you're going to receive. That's not the right location. That's not the right question. Is it possible for my church to have a worship team like what we have on stage? Oh, God, I just wish we had a worship team like that was on stage. I wish, wish we had a worship team that, or like that in our church, in our country. Oh, God, please, God, please, God, please, God. And we beg ourselves and we try to attach our faith to the answer. But the, the, our faith is never, ever supposed to be attached to the answer. Sarah asked the question, is it possible for me in my old age to have, because she was trying to work up inside of her the faith to believe that it was possible in her old age to have a child. God said, wrong question. The right question is, is anything too difficult for our God? Because the, the questions you ask determines the answers you will receive. Right? So if you ask the question, is it possible for my church to grow? Is it possible for, for, this, for me to get this breakthrough? Is it possible for that to happen? And you begin to pray, you begin to leak, seek answers for that. It's the wrong question. The right question is, whatever I'm believing for, is anything too difficult for my God? You don't need the size of faith for, based on the size of the answer. You need the size, like Jesus said, the size of a mustard seed. The smallest seed. Because it's not the size of the faith that matters, it's the location. When Jesus was walking into Jerusalem one day, um, he saw a fig tree. And fig tree wasn't... Uh, 
producing fruit wasn't in its season. Jesus was hungry, cursed the fig tree, and I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking Jesus is having a bad day. He, tre- he cursed a tree. It's not even the season for figs, and he's cursing a tree. He curses the tree. They walk in. The disciples are going, he's in a mood. <laughs> right? They walk into the town. That night, they walk out, and the fig tree is all shriveled up. And Peter goes, this is Mark 11, Peter goes, you got to tell us how you do that. I mean, it wasn't even, I mean, why you did that, I'm not, but how did, you, how did you do that? I mean, you just spoke to it, and Jesus replies, Mark eleven twenty two. He says, have faith in God, period. That's verse 22. Verse 23 is the verse that we all like to quote. Whoever speaks to this mountain does not doubt in his heart, but believes it is possible. God will move, the mountain will move. We quote that verse like everything, but it's the, it's the verse before that is the key. Have faith in God. Not have faith in your faith. Not have faith in your answer. Not have faith. Have faith in God. Period. Is anything too difficult for my God? Jesus led his disciples one night. He says, hey, let's cross over uh, to the other side tonight. Jesus is the one who led them. He says, let's go tonight. So they get into the boat and they cross over uh, the lake and a wild storm comes up and the storm comes up. Uh, and, and it's so, you know, it's, it's so terrifying to these guys. These aren't rookie sailors. These are, you know, Peter, James, and John who grew up on the water as fishermen. They, they've been through storms. They've been on the water. They know how to navigate this, yet they're terrified. Well, meanwhile, Jesus is asleep in, in the bottom of the boat. And they try everything. They, they try, you know, everything they know how to do. And finally, as last-ditch effort, they wake up Jesus and saying, Don't you care that we're going to drown? Jesus doesn't even answer them. I, I can picture them. He just woke up. He, he's, he's probably irritated and grumpy. I was having a good sleep. And, and he wakes up. He goes right past them, right, get, walks to the, to the front of the boat, speaks to the Be calm. Walks, but can I go to sleep now? Walks back in. And, and he looks at the disciples, and they're all kind of like. They look in their faith, faces. How did, how, how did you do that? Jesus has just been teaching on faith all day. Jesus' question to them wasn't, why was your faith so small? His question to them is, where is your faith? He asked them location. Where is your faith? Is anything too difficult for our God. Book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is, this is a fascinating story for me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, uh, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar fancies himself a god, so he builds this big statue and, 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 and tells everyone that they should bow down and, and worship the statue, basically making him a god. And he says, if you don't, I'll kill you. Um, and so everyone is obligated to do that. And this massive crowd bows down except for three young Hebrew children. And they refuse to bow down. And Nebuchadnezzar calls them. He goes, well, maybe they didn't hear me. They're at the back of the room. Maybe they didn't hear. So he gives them another chance. He says, maybe you didn't hear me, you know, bow down. And their response is awesome. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because their response is so, so good. It, their response was, we don't answer to you. Oh, wait a second. Nebuchadnezzar is setting up this entire thing to elevate himself as God. Isn't that right? He sets up the entire thing to say that he's God. And, he, and basically they say, we don't answer to you. I mean, it's the ultimate insult of insults. If Nebuchadnezzar was mad before, he's really mad now. Because don't, we don't answer to you. Now look at what the, the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. This is what they said. They said... They said, our God is able to deliver us from your hand. Look at the the language. 
Our God is able. Is, this, this is faith. This is faith. Our God is able. Is anything too difficult for God? Our God is able to deliver us from your hand. But then they said, they said this. They said, but if he does not. Okay. In my old theology. When I mean by old theology, I mean like a few weeks ago. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> In my old theology, I thought that that question, but he, or that statement, even if he does not, was a doubt in their heart. And I was like, God, how did you do this? How did you deliver them anyway? How did you deliver them anyway when they had doubt? Because it says in Mark 11, if you do not doubt in your heart. And they said, but even God is able. Okay, that's good. But even if he does not, that sounds like a cop-out. Doesn't it? it? Even if he does not. Yet God answers their, their request anyway, doesn't he? Why? If it comes back to the location... It comes back to the location of their faith. Because the location of their faith wasn't in the answer. The location of their faith was in their God. They said, God is able. And our belief in his ability doesn't change whether he does it now or not. Our God is able. Our faith isn't there. And you know why that's so important? Because when did Jesus deliver them? He delivered them in the fire. He showed up. He didn't show up before and save them from the fire. He saved them in the fire. If their faith had been in God is able to deliver us, their faith would have wavered the moment that they got close to the fire, because I guess it's not going to work, I guess not, we're not getting the answer. He's not saving us. He's not saving us. <laughs> Anybody else pray like that? God, you got to answer. You got to answer. You got to. You're not answering. <laughs> I guess it didn't work. Isn't this right? Because we put our faith in our faith, we put our faith. In the answer. And we try to stir up ourselves for the answer. And when something goes wrong, something, when we, we believe for health and we got a twinge of pain, then all of a sudden, I guess it's not working. Am I talking to the right people? We have faith for our church to grow. But when we show up on Sunday morning and it's the same ten faces staring at us, Yes, it didn't work. <laughs> See, God didn't save them. Jesus didn't save them from the fire. He saved them in the fire. And their faith wasn't in their delivery. Their faith was in God's ability. Are we getting this? Yeah. I want to show you something else. In, in the book of uh, Matthew, I want to show you something here. Matthew 9, verse 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I read the Bible with a sense of humor. How do blind men follow I mean, do you ask yourself these questions? You're reading to blind men. Um, there's, there's an actual teaching point in that, by the way. Is if you rely on what you don't have, you will ignore what you do have. When actually what you don't have enhances what you do have. How'd they follow? 
They didn't focus on what they didn't have. They used what they did have. That's, what, that's why Elisha said to the widow woman, what do you want? What do you have? Well, I have nothing except a jar of oil. Jesus said, the people are hungry. What do we have? We've got nothing but two fish and five loaves. See, what you do have is enough. And we focus on what we don't have, and we put our faith in what we're lacking. When we should, focus on what we have. So these blind men follow, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Okay, now this, this is powerful. Son of David, have mercy. Son of David, have Son of David. Son of David means they recognize Jesus as Messiah. They called him Messiah. You're the promised one. They proclaim. This is a faith statement. Messiah, Savior, Jesus. They're, they're calling him as, as God. You're the promise. You're the one. They didn't call him by his, by his given name. They called him by his prophetic name. Jesus, son of David. And when he had came in the house, the, the blind men came to him. Ha, ha, How'd they get in the house? <laughs> now look at, I, I, I don't know if you guys grasped what Teddy said this morning. It, it, to, what he said was brilliant. There are some truths in that. It's so powerful for all of you. A vision is a mental picture of what could be, fueled by a passion, passion that it must be. Yeah, he had a mental picture of what worship could be. But he said it was the passion that fueled them and drove them to make it happen. Okay, You can say, well, I wish I had. But you have to have the passion that it must be. These blind men had a vision of what Jesus could do. But they had a passion. See, this is different. Most of people would have looked at the obstacle and said, oh, he went into the house. Uh, we can't, he's, I guess we'll come back. Uh uh. They went right in to the house with him because they had a passion that, Son of David, this is my day. This is my time. And I'm praying that you're leaving this conference and going, It's my time. This is my time. This has to happen. Our churches will grow. Our missions will, our ministries will grow. This is our time. We're not just getting all stirred up and going, That was a nice conference. I must have. I must have. See, faith, faith isn't wishful thinking. Faith is, is anything too difficult for my God. But it's also attached to, I must have. Okay, watch. The blind man came to him. See, God will let you live at whatever level your faith settles on. God will let you live at whatever level your faith settles on. How badly do you want it? Jesus said to them, look at this question. And here's the right question. Again, we're, we're talking about the right questions. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Let's break that question down. Okay? First, first of all, do you believe that I am able? He didn't say, do you believe you'll receive sight? Look at how he asked the question. Do you believe... I, God, am able. That's the question God's asking. That's, that's the, the right question gives you the right answer. Moses asked, listen, Moses sent the, the Israelites into, into the promised land. Okay, Moses sent the Israelites into the promised land, and, and he said, the, the spies, remember he sent the spies in? And he said to them, go spy out the land and tell us, is it a land flowing with milk and honey? So far, so good. Are the cities fortified, and are the people great and, and mighty, and what should we expect? The spies came back answering the exact question. That, you know, they gave the answers to the question Moses asked. 
They came back. This is why leaders, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful what questions you ask your staff, your church. Because they answer. Will that answer lead to faith or doubt? And their answer was, yeah, it's a land flowing of milk and honey. Look at these grapes. Then they said this. Then they said this. The walls are fortified, and the people are great. And as the more they started talking about all this stuff, and they said, it's a land full of giants. Well, actually, Joshua only killed four giants. What you focus on, you give power to. And you focus on what you lack. You focus on, even in your prayers, See how Jesus taught him to have faith in God? Put your faith there. Is anything too difficult for your God? Then he says, once your faith in God is strong, is anything too difficult? Yeah, nothing's too difficult. All things are possible to God. And you, and you, you, you get your eyes on God. This op- eyes up, eyes up, eyes up. Get your eyes on God. Then he says, speak to the mountain. Tell it to move. David didn't have to say, oh God, he's big. Dear God, help me. Help this rock fly straight. (laughs) Dear God. David didn't pray. David walked right up to the Goliath and said, Today, my God. He, He wasn't focused on the size of the giant at all. He was focused on the size of his God. So when Jesus asked the question, Do you believe I am able. Right question. Right focus. Do, do, Jesus didn't ask, do you believe you'll receive sight? Because they would, uh, 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 yeah, I'm hoping so. <laughs> do you believe I am able to do this? See, in your prayer, a lot of times our prayer are actually faced faith canceling prayers because this is how you and I pray we pray the problem and we explain to God and we express to God the problem God this isn't happening this isn't working and God help with this and God help with that and God help with this and all that you're praying is focusing on what you don't have instead of focusing on what you do have see prayer prayer is not to tell God about your problems as if he doesn't know Prayer is to move you closer to the God who can solve those problems. Prayer is moving your heart to believe that he is able. Worship is elevating God above my situations, above my circumstances, above my feelings, to say, yeah, he is able. So let me ask you a question. What are you believing for? What do you, I mean, so your nation, is, is anything too difficult for God? If you ask this question, is anything too difficult for God? Is 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 anything too difficult? Is it impossible for God to save India? Is anything too difficult for our God? I mean, you answer that question, it's like, ah. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with our God. Jesus said this way, nothing is impossible to him who believes in what? In the answer? See, what you pray, how you pray, the questions you ask are going to determine what you receive. Jesus asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? He, they had already called him out as Messiah, as God, and they said yes. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. The God you perceive is the God you'll receive. Jesus was not able to do miracles in his hometown. Because in his hometown, he was the neighborhood kid, the carpenter. And if you perceive Jesus as a carpenter, you'll get your house fixed. But if you perceive Jesus as Messiah, son of David, you'll get your life fixed. The God you perceive is the God that you receive. It's too difficult for our God. 
And some of you have been praying and praying and praying, and God, it's not working, 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 it's not working. Eyes up. God said to Sarah, said to Abraham, she's asking the wrong question. Can a body this old have a child? Not naturally. Can an entire nation be saved? Not naturally. Can God use me? See, isn't it easier to have faith for somebody else? We have all the faith in the world God can use somebody else. But then we get so wrapped up in our own lack, in our own, in our own heads, in our own spaces. Get out of this space and look up. God used a donkey. Is anything too difficult for our God? Well, but you don't know where I've been. Is anything too difficult for our God? He used murderers, adulterers, donkeys. He used, God used anything. If the Bible is proof of anything, nothing is impossible with our God. God can use me. If he did it for them, he can do it for me. God can use me. Is anything too difficult for our God? When you pray, that's, that's the question to ask. Is anything too difficult for my God? Is anything too difficult for my God? When you get overwhelmed, is anything too difficult for my God? And you spend all of your time pursuing the greatness of our God. You read the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Why? Because the Word builds up your God. Amen? Anything too difficult for our God?